I'm in the communications and education team there where we're focused on helping to articulate NOAA's various climate services to different segments of uh, the public. And I'm very pleased to be working with the American Museum of Natural History over the next three years uh, for helping to produce visualizations that use current science information to help people understand global change issues, so both um, biodiversity and climate change um, within the larger constellation of global change issues affecting the planet. Today we're going to focus on coral reefs around the world. And this is a particularly important issue for those nations and people who live in the tropics where they have coral reefs. Um, they're incredibly beautiful ecosystems. Um, and they are, they underlie the economies of many, many nations and people around the world, both directly through tourism and fisheries, um, but also indirectly through the aesthetic um, of living in a place that has this incredibly vibrant um, ecosystem in its waters, around its shores. We're going to today um, go through a video that the Science Bulletins Program has made at the American Museum of Natural History, and they are a media production group. We'll talk a little bit more about them at the end of the call, but they um, make these videos routinely um, and distribute them to a subscriber network and also distribute free versions of these for use in classrooms via their website, which is sciencebulletins.anmh.org. Uh, Laura Allen, who's a writer and producer on this piece, um, is, uh, has produced a, an information sheet about um, coral reefs that uh, she is distributing with this video that I just want to highlight for a moment because it's going to help us watch this video in just a moment. Um, directing your attention to this main image panel uh, at the bottom of page one, we're going to be looking at a, a moving image that includes several elements. It's going to include data on the screen. And the data are generally color-coded with a legend that appears in the upper right. And I'll explain what this means during the video in just a moment. There's also a calendar in the upper left. So as the images move, they're associated with particular times of last year. And so just make note of these elements in conjunction with the text that explains, gives some context and meaning behind what you're looking at. And there's also a data credit. So everything you're going to see is vetted scientific content uh, that comes from globally important organizations that do the archiving and research uh, relevant to the data set we're going to be examining in more detail today. Um, also, um, a lot of people have contributed to this piece, and I just want to make uh, a plug not only to Coral Reef Watch, which we're going to focus on intensively today because we have Dr. Mark Aiken of Coral Reef Watch with us, um, but also NOAA's Environmental Visualization Laboratory contributed to the production of the images you're looking at, and, and Nance's suit in particular um, made uh, the base images that the artist at the American Museum rendered this visualization from. And I work um, particularly on climate.gov, which is a portal for information about uh, climate services at NOAA, but also just uh, the applications of climate science in various business sectors and different regions, as well as understanding the basic science. So my office is very interested in helping uh, this museum community understand the significance of climate science. In this case, looking at um, the impacts on uh, biological systems around the world of climate and climate change. And we're going to drill into that a bit more but I would just note that all of these resources could be uh, a great help to, to all of you who are 
using this information and this visualization to help teach museum visitors or students in the classroom, they'll find more in-depth information both on this two-page information sheet but also at these websites. A few of you on the line are uh, joining from the Science on a Sphere Network, which is a group of uh, institutions around the world that use a five-foot diameter physical sphere on, onto which global images can be projected. And the Science on a Sphere Network is hosting some of the assets that you're looking at today uh, and serving them through its website as well. So we're hoping that um, this webinar can help all these different communities of people to better use the information in the visualization and supplement your own knowledge so that you can teach others about this important issue. So um, before we start talking to Mark, I just want to go through the visualization once with everyone so everyone watch, has seen it once and is on the same page about um, the themes of this visualization. And so the piece opens with an image of Earth and mentions that most of the anthropogenic warming that's gone into the Earth system has been absorbed by the ocean, which is something that people don't realize. And a warming ocean is dangerous for corals. Reasons being coral bleaching. So corals physically eject the algae that live inside of the invertebrate coral organism when um, water gets too hot, and when that persists, the corals can die because they count on that algae for getting energy out of the water column through photosynthesis. What you're looking at here now is a data set animated from Coral Reef Watch, and we're looking at January 4th, 2010. The yellow areas represent mild um, accumulated heat stress. The orange areas are where bleaching is likely, and then pink areas are where likely that one would see widespread coral death over time. Um, let me just move this control bar so everyone can see this. 2010 was one of the um, warmest global um, events in, in the uh, tropical ocean leading to widespread stress for coral. So this is a global event, and Dr. Aiken is going to talk more about that with us um, after we go through this. What you're looking at, though, is the sequence through time and now a summary from the entire year of the stress experienced by corals around the globe. That stress has already resulted in a lot of reports of bleaching and death in corals. This isn't a completely synoptic data set, but every X on this screen is an observation from a scientist or someone working um, in an area that has uh, coral reefs. So what does all this mean? There are um, things that people can do locally to prevent um, stress to coral reefs, but really it's the increased temperature of the ocean and uh, due to greenhouse gas emissions um, driving up global temperature that is threatening coral ecosystems around the planet. So that's really why we have a program called Coral Reef Watch. So, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce everyone to Mark Aiken. Hello, Mark. Hi, how are you? Great, great. I'm glad to be talking to you. And, um, and could you just, by way of introduction, give folks um, a little uh, brief on how you came to study corals and why from space? So I, I run, as Ned said, a, a group in NOAA called Coral Reef Watch that uses satellites to look at the sea surface temperatures that cause coral bleaching as well as other things. Uh, my background actually is in coral reef ecology. I started um, working on corals while a uh, doctoral student at the University of Miami and began doing work on the long-term effects of the 82-83 El Nino, which was the first time we really saw large-scale bleaching. Um, and since that time, I, I've worked for NOAA in 
uh, what's now the Climate Program Office, and in uh, uh, since then, the Paleoclimatology Program, and now here, uh, spending a lot of time looking at the influences the climate has on coral reefs, and uh, so that's uh, that's how I came to be here. The reason that we do this is because it became apparent that, um, in, in fact, the uh, influence of warm temperatures on coral reefs could be measured from satellites. And by going through and building products that use satellite sea surface temperature data, we can provide uh, information in, in near real time. We update this twice a week uh, to provide this information to coral reef managers and scientists and other interested people all around the world. So all of the products that we'll be speaking to, the sort of things that you see in this animation, um, are available uh, on our website um, and, and all, as are all of our data. Now, okay, so before we go on, I just want yeah. to raise something. Um, and, and Laura, maybe you want to uh, jump in and let me know what you saw. The, um, for me, the animation was very jumpy. I, it, it actually didn't even show all the screens. Yeah, it was a little bit stuttery for us, too. And this is uh, the reason why is um, sometimes the WebEx might not be able to keep up with the speed. So we're going to try playing a, a, a smaller version that might play a little bit faster, but won't reflect uh, how lovely and crisp the, the colors might look. Uh, when you see it in actuality. I will say that uh, if you've ever seen this product or anything like it from Science Bulletins as a, a HD movie, it's a completely different experience. But um, noting your concern there, Mark, I will try, Laura, I'm sorry to say, I'll just try a lower resolution version of it while the other one's downloading. Um, and what, I'm, what we're going to do now, you guys, is go frame by frame anyway, so it should we should have enough latency that uh, people can see each screen one by one. So this first screen is this first shot, is hopefully you see right now the globe, and it's just making the point that um, the anthropogenic, in other words, the human cause warming of Earth's system has mostly gone into warming the ocean. And that's evident through the expansion of water and sea level rise, but it's also evident through increased temperature in the different ocean basins around the planet. So, Mark, um, you mentioned that satellites give us this planet-wide or synoptic perspective about um, sea surface temperature. How do, how do you... Uh, Satellites measure sea surface temperature, and why is that important for coral reefs? Well, it's a thermometer on a really long cord. I mean, no, just kidding. Um, just like many of you have um, uh, may have seen thermographs that are used in museums, or maybe the ones that are used in airports, or the ones that are are um, used to uh, do a, an energy survey of your home. These are instruments that look at infrared, and by looking at the amount of infrared coming back off the surface of the Earth, they can actually measure the temperature. And so what the satellite is doing is, is telling us through a, a fairly sophisticated algorithm based on the infrared light coming off the surface of the ocean what the temperature is um, at points all around the globe. And so that's important uh, for corals uh, because why? Because it isn't sea surface temperature. It's really measuring just uh, less than even a millimeter of the water, right? It is. But the important thing that we do is uh, most of our products are not based on just the absolute temperature at the surface, but what's called an anomaly. In other words, how different the surface temperatures are from what you would normally see during this time of year. And we use a special type of anomaly, in fact, <clears throat> that compares the temperatures against the, um, the normal temperatures that you find during the warmest summer months. And during that warmest summer month, what you see are temperatures that are the, the temperatures that corals are used to seeing, because that's what you see every year. So when those, when we look at the anomaly... So this is the reefer. 
I'm getting some questions uh, from your attendees that they're only seeing black screens. They're not seeing any pictures. Okay. Uh, I, I was getting that a moment ago as well, Ned. Okay. Let me switch to a... Uh, right, right now I'm seeing the what is bleaching, um, but it's behind your WebEx control center. Okay, we have a very serious delay then. Okay, I will switch, and I apologize to everyone for that. I will try to get rid of this, uh, this view. You know, one option if you want to try it is, I, I don't know if, if maybe it's the connection on your end, we could try running these off of mine instead. Um, I'll try one more time here. Yeah. Um, and if everyone could tell me if they're still seeing a black screen, please tell Clarissa. Yeah, I'm seeing the what is bleaching uh, PDF behind the WebEx Center still. I'm seeing that Clarissa has taken control of the display, so I'm sorry to say I'm not. I wonder why. I've seen James is wrong. That's odd. Okay, let me make you back to the presenter. I apologize for that. I'm not sure what happened there. We are now encountering technical difficulties. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, Let's see. It may clear it up. We have Ned's desktop in looks like green. Green now. There we go. Um, got it. Got the screen. Okay. Let's get getting to the point here uh, about coral reefs then. That essentially starts with an image of um, coral reefs across the planet. So this is um, this is a data set describing that's been archived by WRI. That's the that's, can you tell us who WRI is and what they do to monitor coral reefs around the world? Well, this is from the recent report that the World Resources Institute just. Uh, release that is called uh, Reefs at Risk Revisited. It's a part of a, an analysis that was done um, as a 10-year retrospective of a previous analysis of the condition of the coral reefs around the world and the, especially the threats that those coral reefs are experiencing. The data actually um, come to WRI from uh, an organization known as ReefBase, which is a global um, database of coral reef information. Okay, so ReefBase uh, provides us a map of where our corals are, and I, I think a takeaway here, in case everyone didn't realize it, is that the major reef building corals are all in the, pretty much in the tropical and very near subtropical uh, ocean waters. Um, so this first image uh, talks about bleached coral, and I'm going to pause my movie and, and ask that folks let Theresa or me know if they can see an image on screen with a bleached coral. Right now I'm still on um, the uh, warming oceans are endangering coral reefs. Okay. Um, we'll just have to wait for the video and WebEx to catch up. While we're, while we're I was talking and I, and I, <laughs> that was, had muted myself, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we're just seeing the thing that, uh, Mark said, just the, the one slide that says warming oceans. Okay, um, Laura, do you have the video on your computer? I do. Uh, let's see. Uh, or, or we could we could ask Mark to take the video as well, because this could be confined to my computer, and I don't want to hold the whole uh, webinar as hostage if it's my internet connection slowing us down. Let's let's see what I can do. I might need a few minutes. I actually don't have it. <coughs> so, Excuse me. Mark, do you have it ready to go? I have it up. Okay, Teresa, if you would please pass the WebEx video to Mark Aiken. He can share his desktop and we can see if that improves our ability to show this. All right, here we go. Okay, it says I am the presenter. 
Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning of it and start playing. And Teresa, let me know. So what you need to do is share your desktop. Okay. And let's see, share your desktop. I think I just did. Actually, it's showing my. I'm. Are you sure you passed it, Teresa? Yes, he has. We're okay. just waiting for it to pass over. I think. Unless you have the same background on your desktop. Uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. There we go. You should have a screen right behind it. So let me know if you see something from my screen. My event control is saying you are sharing your desktop. I think, Mark, we are seeing your screen. Okay. Yep, with the video on as the main image. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit go, and let's see how well it plays. Um, or if, if the WebEx controlling that. It looks good from from my perspective. I mean, okay. it's, it's definitely Are you on warming moving. oceans now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so maybe uh, is the animation moving smoothly this time, Teresa, Laura? Mark, why don't you pause right here at Bleached Coral, please? Will do. Okay, so this is the central idea in the whole piece, so let's, let's take a moment to talk about it. Um, what does coral bleaching mean? So coral bleaching is something that occurs when the coral actually loses algae that live in their tissues. Um, let me, since I do have this, let me see if we can bring up the, the PowerPoint and see if this is going to, to show properly. Um, are you seeing a single screen of what is bleaching or a split screen of mine? A uh, split screen. Okay, so let me do it the other way. Um, uh, still doing it that way. So while Mark's doing that, I'll just, I'll just, I'll talk while you walk, Mark. Um, the, uh, I think one, thing that people sometimes are new to realize is that corals are animals, they're invertebrates, and that um, they've evolved a clever way to extract energy living where they do. They live in the uh, shallow part of the ocean, and as such, they do receive sunlight. And in order to make use of sunlight, uh, since they're invertebrates and can't photosynthesize, they give a home to uh, algae that live inside of the polyps in uh, in the coral, in the in the inside of the coral reefs, um, individual polyps. So um, that's a way for coral reefs to sort of have the best of both worlds and uh, take advantage of the work that plants can do to provide energy, and they really count on that um, energy. Um, so when it gets, what happens when water gets warm? Why do why do corals eject those in the valley, which are the algae? Right, and let me know if you have the what is bleaching on screen now. It's still the same for me. Okay. Um, so the important thing is that if you imagine the children's game, 20 questions, uh, you start with the animal, vegetable, mineral. Corals are actually all three. Um, the coral animal has microscopic algae living inside its tissue. And the combination of that plant and animal build the skeleton that makes corals and coral reefs. When stressed, the symbiotic relationship between the coral and the algae breaks down, and the corals literally expel the algae out of their uh, out of their bodies. And so these algae are released into the water column um, by uh, by the corals. Uh, at that time. That leaves the, the tissues, which are uh, effectively clear, because what you normally see in the color of a coral is uh, the coral coming, I mean, the color coming from the algae. That effectively leaves the tissue clear, and you see the white skeleton underneath. So the, the image, um, what, what do you have on screen now? The title sign. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's taking a while to catch up. I'm seeing the what is bleaching. Oh, okay, great. Yep. Well, in, in that case, in the lower right-hand corner, you see a pair of corals side by side. 
the one on the right is normally pigmented. The one on the left is severely bleached. And these two corals, one of them was affected more by the warming than the other. And it's actually expelled all of the algae, um, at least to, to the uh, amount that's visible from the naked eye. If this continues for a long time, the coral is actually starving because the algae provide most of the uh, energy for the coral. So the, the algae are producing um, energy just like chlorophyll does in, uh, in, in leaves, and that is then transferred from the algae to the coral as a major source of the coral's food. So if this lasts a long time, uh, the coral can die from starvation. Um, otherwise, if it's, if it's brief or not severe, the coral can actually recover their algae and survive. Either way, though, they are more stressed and are more susceptible to disease. So what I'll do is see if, um, if we can show the difference between an unbleached and a bleached reef here. Um, Laura, are you seeing the bleaching in Belize? Yes, we are. Perfect. Um, what you're seeing here is a reef in Belize, an unbleached condition in 1995, and the next shot is almost the exact same spot in 1998 during a severe bleaching event. So this is the kind of transition that it goes through. And in this case, this was a severe event that was long-lasting. And what you should now see on the upper right is, after that event, that this has now turned into an ecosystem that's dominated by algae and sponges. So it's not the coral reef that you had before. You're not building corals. It's, you know, it has a very different influence in terms of being the basis of the, the food chain for uh, this coral reef environment. So what really has happened here? Why, why have algae moved in, and why is that significant for more organisms than just the coral itself? Well, the, the coral reef, number one, there are always forces that are building up and breaking down the coral reefs at the same time. These are natural forces. And if you see a, uh, a reef that is bleached, where most of it's died and it's switched over to algae and sponges, you're no longer building that reef. And so the forces that break it down are going to be dominated and slowly over time that reef gets flattened out. It's almost like uh, you start out by having a disease that goes through and kills all the trees in a forest, and then over time they get toppled by uh, natural forces, and eventually you're, you have no more forest. And just like you imagine a forest, those trees are providing the basis for the food chain, the places where things live, um, uh, the, the source of a lot of, of food and nutrition for the entire ecosystem, basically the, the, the bottom of that food chain, the same thing happens in a coral reef. You don't have the, the food being produced by the algae. You don't have the space being provided um, uh, from, the, uh, from the corals. The whole system is now changed because the kind of algae that grows on the surface of corals after they die is a completely different type of algae that does not form the, uh, provide the same function. And that's incredibly important for the whole global ocean ecosystem, isn't it? I mean, corals provide those nutrients and structure for a vast amount of the life in the ocean, isn't that right? That's correct, especially for the areas that surround coral reefs. Now, coral reefs are extremely diverse areas, but they, they only cover a very small part of the ocean. So it, they don't drive what goes on out in the middle of the ocean, but in the area where those reefs are and are have very rich fisheries that many people depend on, uh, the, the corals are really providing the basis for that food chain. And many people say corals are more diverse than a tropical rainforest. Do you agree? Absolutely. Most of the studies that, uh, to date have shown that you have more diversity in coral reefs, so we probably should be calling rainforests the coral reefs of the land and the other way around. But Michael, uh, who's listening in, um, was asking, is there a similarity on land? And I guess he might be thinking about something like mycorrhizae and, uh, that provide nutrients to trees. Of, of a variety of kinds of uh, plants, including a lot of trees in the temperate 
forests on land. Um, an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and, and if you think about some of the things that have happened, again, because of rising uh, temperatures around the world, uh, many of the pine forests, or uh, the, the mixed, uh, uh, it's mostly lodgepole pine forests uh, of the western U.S. along the, the Rockies and going up into Canada, um, have been experiencing problems where there are diseases that have come through and killed the trees on a large scale, and those are now very susceptible to forest fires. And so we're seeing huge forest fires knocking out areas and completely changing the ecosystem. And, and again, it's the, it's the loss of that primary uh, builder of the ecosystem, in that case, um, on land. It's similar to what happens when the bleaching goes on in the ocean. So let's, uh, let's move into the next segment of the video, if we could, Mark. Um, because it's really that section where we talk about 2010, which was an extraordinary year in terms of heat stress on corals globally. So it really was a global um, heat stress event, which is not unheard of, but it's unusual and it's that's noteworthy. So that's right. And, and to, one thing to point out before we get there, the uh, what I have on screen now is uh, showing all the areas around the world that were affected by bleaching in 1997, 98, 99 during a major El Nino and La Nina event, which prior to 2010 was the only time we had seen massive bleaching around the world. Um, and in that case, we had uh, what's been estimated to have been the loss of about 15% of the world's reefs. So with that, I'll switch over to the, the animation. And on the animation, you'll, you'll be seeing as we get into that. So right now, the, the animation that you're hopefully seeing um, is the, what the bleach coral looks like. Um, now we're moving into um, uh, the, the images from 2010. And our data from satellites uh, can be used to calculate the stress on corals. There you're seeing the, the different degrees, and hopefully on your screen you've just seen the three stages, and I'm going to pause it momentarily um, here. Mild bleaching occurs when the heat stress is, is, is very limited, and so conditions are warm. It causes some damage to the corals, but not too much. The, the darker red colors get into periods where um, bleaching is likely on a very large scale, and you start seeing mass bleaching events. And then when it gets even higher, you start to see the depth of corals. And so let me just double check, is, is everyone seeing the three scales and the date January 4th, 2010 on screen? In front, I'm a measure of everybody. I, I'm seeing it. hope everybody else is too. <laughs> Great. Okay. So we'll start the animation then, and what this is going to do is move forward from the beginning of 2010 through the year as this event unfolds. So first you had this major bleaching going on in the, in the Central Pacific. Now the next place you see bleaching is over in the Indian Ocean, and then that spreads into Southeast Asia, where it was really severe, and they were having uh, tremendous bleaching going on there. And then finally, over on the right, the Caribbean. And what I'll do, just to, to give you a chance to see that again, let me drop back and we'll, we'll just go through that animation one more time real quickly. And you see the different places they're being hit, first the Central Pacific, then uh, the Indian Ocean. It then warms in Southeast Asia, which was the, the, the first of the really severely hit areas. And then finally now you see it warming in the Caribbean. And uh, this was a severe event that follows on the heels of a Caribbean bleaching event we just had in 2005 that was really severe. So, Mark, um, Michael was wondering, can he get these data for his students? Absolutely. Um, the, the data that uh, on the, the heat stress uh, are all available online on our website. So when you follow the link to coralreefwatch.noaa.gov, and that's one of the links you see on that background or, uh, that Laura has provided. Um, you can get all of the data on the heat stress. 
Um, they're downloadable as data files, as images. Um, they're available in Google Earth as um, uh, individual files and as animations. Uh, we have a lot of these that are available. And a paper on the 2005 bleaching event um, is one that we just recently published in uh, uh, November of last year uh, in the journal PLOS One, the P Public Library of Science One. Terrific. And we have one other question um, from Adriana. Um, and she wants to know, can zozenzeli live on their own? Once they're expelled, how, how can they survive in the open ocean? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting one. It's a really good question. And what you can find is that on any coral reef, there actually are free living zozenzeli. These are these microscopic algae that live inside the tissues of corals. What's interesting, though, is once they've been expelled, we're not sure that the expelled algae are really able to make that transition very effectively. So it's not like those algae go out and, and live and do well uh, separate from the corals. Um, in many cases, they actually don't survive the transition. Some may. Um, most of the recovery of corals also does not come from getting those enzoli back from the water column, but usually is just a growth of the very few those anthelae that are still left in that highly bleached coral. Good question, Adriana. Thanks. So um, let's so let's take a moment just to look at this last image that you've got paused up on the screen because it's kind of it's a kind of a composite from throughout the year, isn't it? It is. What you're looking at is the total maximum accumulated heat stress. So. In all of those areas you saw in the animation, you were seeing the months in which the bleaching was occurring in specific areas as that thermal stress moved around. Here you're looking at the maximum across the globe in 2010, so you can see all of those major areas that were hit simultaneously. The Central Pacific, uh, a bit in the Indian Ocean, the major warming in Southeast Asia, and the major warming <coughs> in uh, the Caribbean, where the with the, the, the worst or largest scale bleaching events were in Southeast Asia and the Caribbean in 2010. It really is a global phenomenon. I was trying to think of a way to explain this to someone who hasn't thought about it before in terms of a teapot or something. And there are a couple of ways to heat up the water in a pot. I mean, you could put it on a low temperature for a long time and warm up all the water, or you could turn it to a hot, temperature for a short period of time and also warm up all the water. And I think it might be useful for people to know that you're kind of tracking both, aren't you? We are, but really the way that uh, the kind of warming you have that affects coral reefs, talking the thermal stress you're looking at here, is really the first of those. It's a, it's a very low heat on the teapot. Um, usually, the temperatures don't get more than one to two degrees C above that maximum, uh, you know, warmest summer month temperature. So you don't really have re very, very hot temperatures causing this. Instead, they're temperatures that are hotter than normal, but they stay that way for a long time. So it's, it's very similar to that low teapot that eventually gets to the same boil. Interesting. But yeah, one one degree makes a big difference for life on the planet. It does. It does. Well, let's let's continue through uh, the visualization. I think there are a couple other big points to hit. Great, and we're stepping through now. Now, this is where we go from the temperatures to showing those um, those reports of bleaching. So people hopefully are seeing better this time the observations of bleached or dead coral from around the globe. You see the. Southeast Asian region there that was hit, some places in the Indian Ocean, um, and it'll then come around to uh, the, the Western Atlantic and the Caribbean region. Um, let me back up just a second there because I, we, we came into this next segment just a, a little bit earlier than, than when we were able to see the Caribbean. There we go. Now you can you can still make out the area in the Caribbean there up in the corner where the major leaching reports came in. So how are these reports collected? Who's making these observations? 
There, there are two different ways. Um, the reports so far and what you're seeing on here are the, the anecdotal reports that have come in as people have sent emails to one of our major listservs, uh, email listservs of coral reef scientists around the world called Coral List. Uh, there are emails that have come in to us here in, at Coral Reef Watch. And there are also reports that have been um, entered online into ReefSpace. And uh, that's, uh, we mentioned them earlier, the, the database where all those um, Coral Reef sites are. You'll see they're part of the, uh, the citation of, of data sources there at the bottom. Uh, the ReefSpace uh, reports. Uh, we work with ReefSpace uh, to have all of the centralized reports go to them. The more um, complete version then comes if a group works to uh, contact the, the scientific community and start to actually get a careful analysis of all of the reports that come in from the scientists who do surveys in the area. And there's a, a group uh, in Southeast Asia and Australia that are working together to pull in all of the bleaching reports for uh, the Southeast Asian event. And we're working with collaborators throughout the, the Caribbean region to uh, get a comprehensive view of what went on in 2010 in the Caribbean. That's, that's cool. So it, it, we're going from all the way from personal observations up to satellite remote sensing and this visualization, which I think is really neat. That's right. And that paper I mentioned um, that, that we published in November of uh, 2010 uh, is, is that synthesis of those things from from divers in the water and how much bleaching they were seeing or how much mortality they saw as the corals died, and tracking that all the way up to the extent of thermal stress seen from the satellites. So um, at the end of the piece, we sort of, there are a couple of key points when we talk about local and global issues. So on this screen with four images on it, if we just pause there, um, let's just talk about those. Do people really blast on coral reefs, and why, why do they do that? Uh, well, there are two kinds of blasting that go on on coral reefs. There are some areas, and mostly this has now stopped, that used to use living coral reefs as building material. And that's not depicted on here, but they would actually go out and blast to, to break off pieces of reef to bring up on land and build things. What you're seeing here, which is just as hideous, is uh, blast fishing. And this isn't something highly sophisticated. This is usually being done by the poorest of the poor fishermen in um, developing countries, uh, it's especially seen in places like the Philippines, where they will go out, they will make uh, ammonium nitrate bombs, basically you know, fertilizer bombs from cheap things you can get. Um, uh, at, at a hardware store, uh, fertilizer and diesel fuel. Make these in glass bottles with rags for fuses. Light them, toss them over the side. They sink down in the water. They explode. That stuns uh, or kills the fish. They collect the fish, and that's what they use as a method of fishing. The problem is at the same time, it kills the coral. It actually breaks up the coral and it can very much accelerate that process of taking a three-dimensional reef and turning it just to a plane of rubble. So kind of quickly going through these others, the, the thing on the left is unfortunately more common than we'd like to think. I mean, people go travel all over the world to go scuba diving or observing the most beautiful ecosystems on the planet, and then inadvertently even just touching reefs can kill them, can't it? It can, and, it, and you don't have to be lying hard on a reef like those that person seems to be uh, to cause breakage. I mean, just the, the inadvertent fin kick uh, can, can break pieces off. Touch can cause damage. In many places, you'll have snorkelers who'll be literally standing on top of live corals uh, to talk to each other about the beautiful corals they're looking at. <laughs> That's that's a sad irony there. Um, in terms of pollution and coastal development, those seem kind of like broader scale patterns. So what can be done locally to prevent uh, problems from pollution or murky water or uh, development directly impinging on reefs? What's being done on that? 
Well, well, first of all, development has to be done with the ecosystem in mind. So you have, you can't overbuild areas. Uh, you can't uh, bring in huge amounts of, of, um, of landfill that often then erodes off onto the surface uh, of the of the water and down down onto the reef. The the, the development has to keep in mind that you have to be able to have water flow off in a gentle way, in the way that it naturally does. And at the same time, as that water is running off, we have to make sure that we're, we're treating the land well so that we're not, over, um, we're, we're not uh, removing the, uh, uh, the plants that hold the soil in place. Um, when the land is treated poorly, there's too much deforestation or land, poor land use, you'll end up carrying sediments out into the water that can smother the corals. Uh, in addition, if the waters are not held properly and allowed to percolate on, on land, you're going to carry out a lot of chemical contaminants. And all of these things are, are among the, the biggest problems uh, that can destroy corals locally near where people are living. So these local things don't, if you, if, if those are addressed, it doesn't necessarily ensure the long-term health of the reef, but it can help the resilience of the reef in the future. And uh, so what, what was this last message? Um, what, uh, we're, we're trying to direct people also to the fact that there's this global um, aspect to understanding the impact humans are having on uh, Reefs. Um, uh, that's right. It, we're, we've already seen a major increase in greenhouse gases, both carbon dioxide and, and other gases. And the problem is it's not just reducing emissions. Because we're seeing all of the problem with coral bleaching now, we're seeing that the warming has already reached a point that's beyond critical for coral reefs. We not only need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but we actually have to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere below where we are now. And that's going to take time because, of course, we're going in the other direction. Um, our emissions are continuing to increase. So we're, we're looking at two things that we need to do, and they're, they're, they're not um, mutually exclusive, and, in fact, we need to do both. One is we need to get the greenhouse gas emissions under control and eventually start reducing the amount of, of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But the second is because that's going to take a, a long time, no matter how quickly we act on it. We need to address those local factors so that the reefs have the best chance of surviving until we've gotten the atmosphere back under control. So um, I, the the piece kind of ends on this beautiful image of reefs. I think for me that just reminds me of how important <laughs> and beautiful these ecosystems are, and and that that's that, that's a worthy goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We've had a number of really good rhetorical and directed questions from Adriana about other local impacts, such as runoff of fertilizers and pesticides. The fact that a lot of the fishing that, uh, you know, we were looking at blast fishing, um, and uh, some of those fishes end up in our markets in North America, in the United States. Um, and um, she had one more question about hurricanes and coastal development and whether that increases the coastal development increases the impact to reefs. Um, when a hurricane or tropical cyclone comes through? It, it does, um, and not only from hurricanes and tropical cyclones, but that tsunamis as well. Uh, the tsunami, not the most recent one in Japan, because that was at the northern area beyond where there are most reefs, but many of you may remember last year there was a major tsunami in uh, American Samoa, and a lot of debris was carried out onto the reefs, damaging the corals. That happened very quickly, but you get the same thing with, with hurricanes and cyclones where a lot of debris will be washed out as a result of, of destruction along the coastline. Um, the, you also, with strong hurricanes, get direct damage just from the, the movement of sand and rubble underwater. So hurricane 
games are quite damaging to reefs. But they're a part of the natural system. As long as we don't have the other sort of stressors in place, um, reefs and hurricanes have coexisted for, uh, for thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of years. Um, and so if, if we weren't doing all these other things like you see on screen or the fertilizer like you mentioned, uh, hurricanes by themselves really wouldn't be that big a concern. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Um, please continue uh, sending questions into the Q&A window. At this point, I'd like to ask the researcher to unmute Vivian's uh, microphone. Vivian Trukinski is the director of the Science Bulletins Program, and um want to give her a chance to tell a little bit more about the program and, um, and how to get some of these resources. Um, into different institutions and how you can use them. Uh, Adriana, who's been contributing some thoughtful questions here, is also uh, a researcher at the museum and um, does has done a fair amount of online teaching, I understand, as well. So there are resources at the museum about um, learning more about the ocean as a system. And um, so if we can get Vivian unmuted or maybe ask Vivian to go downstairs and get on Laura's phone. No, I think I'm unmuted, Ned. Okay, it's, I couldn't tell. <laughs> I just I passed her the mic. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so thanks very much for participating today. And, and, of course, we all apologize for some of the technical issues up front. Um, but it's great that we have so many different people from so many in different institutions participating. So we thought it was doubly important to just say a little bit about how you can um, get access to these materials in different ways that people are using them. And then I'm going to make a pitch for hearing back from you some of um, how you learned about the webinar and what your interests in the materials are so that we can sort of better serve you in the future. Um, but Science Bulletins was developed by AMNH, I think really starting in 1997, with this idea of creating an ongoing stream of current um, science for the museum and for distribution outside the museum. So we distribute this as an exhibition product. Um, we create content um, relevant to four different areas of natural sciences, and they are um, biodiversity and conservation, um, under which this visualization was developed, earth science, um, astrophysics, and human biology and evolution. So we show those content streams in our four different halls. We offer them um, to other institutions, informal science institutions, for exhibition as well on a, on a subscription basis. Um, the subscription fees are um, charged on a sliding scale, so depending on the size of the institution, um, we can try and work with you and adjust the fee to suit your budget. Um, it's a, a, a consistently updated stream of high definition content suitable for a very large screen display. Um, and every stream contains an introduction to the area of science and then um, bi weekly news updates, visualizations in Earth and bio specifically, such as this one and also documentary feature stories that follow researchers into the field around the world and into laboratories and really um, hopefully introduce audiences to the men and women who are doing science and some of the most cutting edge research questions they're addressing. Um, so that is one way to, to get this material from your institution. Another way is that all of the content is offered freely online. So that would be for use in homes and classrooms. Um, not for exhibition use, not for, you know, any kind of public forum, um, but really for more educational, direct educational use. Um, they're available, these videos are available in streaming formats and downloadable formats, so depending on what suits your needs. Um, and they always have a list of, uh, they have synopses. The feature documentary stories have expanded essays that are related to them, and there are educator guides um, that help teachers make connections with their curriculum and guide discussion in the classroom. So that's kind of the writ large you know, view of the program. Right now you can find all of the content at um, amnh.org backslash science bulletins. 
in the future, I will say that um, we're working on redesigning the site so that the, there may be a change in that address, and we'll reach out to people and let them know how to find our content on a, on a new site. But um, in the meantime, I would love to make a pitch to people. Um, if you're interested in letting us know how you found out about the program and what your interests are, you can email Kala, who you got in touch with to sign up for, to register for this. Um, tell her a little bit about yourself and um, what you like in the program, what you'd like to see more of, and, and what your interests are. We'd really appreciate it. And I'll just echo that. I mean, that kind of feedback is really helpful for uh, people like Mark and for me to make sure that um, we're helping people understand the Earth system and the climate system um, writ large and connections to such important issues as coral reefs. And um, I'm seeing a couple of uh, more questions. I don't think I can get to all of them that have come through in the last couple of minutes, but um, one question came in from Michael about um, citizen science. So this maybe goes back to you, Mark, and the uh, Coral List and Coral Reef Watch and Reef Base contributions of monitoring coral reefs. What can citizens do to contribute to um, monitoring coral reefs? I, I want to just get a couple of these questions answered before we close. And, um, Great, yeah, the, uh, the data that you see when the uh, animation gets to those X's, uh, some of those actually are coming in from citizen science. The uh, reporting on reef base can come in from any individual uh, that wishes to report a bleaching event that's out there. So the data that come in are a combination of those from professional scientists as well as citizen scientists. There are, in fact, programs uh, in different areas, uh, there's a uh, program around the world for making observations on coral reefs um, that are uh, are performed by people from citizen scientists on on up to the professionals. Um, uh, the the um, um, there there are also local programs. Uh, in certain local areas. The Florida Keys and Australia's Great Barrier Reef have bleach watch programs um, and then uh, uh, that, that are specifically looking at coral bleaching. So these are, are great and we love getting people in, involved in these programs. When people travel and go diving, often uh, it doesn't take too much sleuthing around to find a conservation organization that's focused on reefs if you're going uh, to a place that has them. And it's just a good idea to touch base with those folks who can tell you about um, opportunities to be involved and help people understand um, the beauty of that local resource and efforts to protect it. So, right. And Reef Check is the one that works globally. There also are um, fish organiz uh, uh, observations done through um, um, uh, done through Project Reef, where they do fish counts. Uh, all around the world, and so similar to uh, bird watchers, there are fish watchers. Well, thanks so much again, Mark, for uh, for working on this visualization that everyone can have as a resource, and um, and thanks to everyone for participating in this webinar. And please tune in next time, <laughs> and and send in comments because it's important for all of us to hear from you. And I'll just add, this is Laura from AMNH. We're going to be uh, posting the piece that you saw and the associated backgrounder on our website. We're also going to be posting it to the Science on Sphere website, the Science on Sphere version. And we'll let everybody know when these pieces formally go up on the web so that you can access that URL um, to find all this. And my thanks to all of you for pulling this together because it uh, is a very nice piece that uh, I think is going to have great educational value. And I, I hope all of you out there uh, listening and participating on the call um, will get great use out of it. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ned. You're very welcome. Questions, uh, all questions posed to me, Ned, that uh, I was not able to get in the Q&A session. Uh, I'll send those to you, and then you can post and responses and send that out. Excellent. Thank you, Teresa. Bye, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all.